Chapters twelve and thirteen of War and Women by Mrs. St. Clair Stobart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twelve. But we had one red letter day. Having grown accustomed to finding the villages when we arrived either burnt to the ground or deserted, and to being met by skin and bone dogs and cats which ravenously begged of us food we could ill spare we could scarcely believe our ears when we heard one evening as we approached a village the joyous sound of a crowing cock promptly the soldiers were called and told to find immediately and raid against payment of course that cock roost wherever it might be within a few minutes the escort returned triumphantly with half a dozen already slaughtered fowls and that evening we had roast chicken for supper we had no cooking pots but we threaded the six fowls on a long stick supported on either side of the campfire by two iron rods taken from one of the ox yokes and we hungrily enjoyed what was for us a rare feast there was no bread sauce but appetite sauce was a wonderful substitute and whilst we ate the villagers mostly women bulgarians gathered round us talking with heroic resignation of the destitution which stared them in the face they all as usual had blood-curdling stories of rapes and mutilations committed by the turks upon their fellow villagers amongst the group was one man who was a priest and another who was in ordinary times a schoolmaster both seemed particularly alert and intelligent and i asked them how they accounted for the extraordinary success of the allies over the turks ah they answered we bulgarians always knew the war must come and we had predicted the result how they argued could it be otherwise every man is a soldier and every soldier owns his bit of land therefore every soldier is fighting for himself as well as for his country and his fellow countrymen and the turk what does he fight for the country is nothing to him he conquers with the sword but he never settles or mixes with the conquered races yes but i said hoping to draw on my friends though you bulgarians fight for your country the turk fights for his faith is not that as powerful as incentive to deeds of valour the priest smiled scornfully faith the turk has no longer a faith and that is why he loses battles a soldier who believes that if he dies fighting he will go straight to paradise might think it worth while to kneel for twenty-four hours at a stretch up to his waist in water and blood in the trenches one thing against another but the young turks have been to paris that is now their paradise and they don't get there by staying in blood-filled trenches we are fighting to free ourselves from a tyranny we can no longer bear we have an ideal before us the turks are only fighting to keep up a condition of affairs which is unjust they have no ideal they will never beat us then these peasants told us stories of the battle which had taken place around their village for it was here that the flower of the professional world of sophia had been destroyed here that the wayward professor upon whom dr radoff and i had called had as i surmised been killed that was a memorable evening we had outspanned on a high plateau surrounded on two sides by rocky hills like those of dartmoor and commanding to the southwest an extensive view over the vast plain in which adrianople is set as the crow flies we were not far distant from the besieged city of this we were reminded by the continuous booming of the besieging guns our imagination had not been blunted by the brutalities of war and for us that was a nerve-racking sound for we knew though not a word was said that every rumble of those cannons and every flash of those spiteful fires as they blazed from the cannon's mouth into the darkness meant brave men killed or worse still maimed and shattered and homes made desolate and all that evening searchlights swept the sky and penetrated the recesses of our ox-carts and as an additional reminder that we were now well within the area of war the peasants pointed and told us where even now at this moment there were lying the corpses of many turks still unburied and the lightly covered bodies of those many brave bulgarians who had perished in battle around this village my driver pietro told me that with his people it was the custom to put a lighted candle and some food upon the grave a month after death and that they dug the grave shallow and tacked on the lid of the coffin very lightly so that the dead might get out if they felt inclined but these poor dead who were around us that night were not cumbered with coffins they were however mercifully hidden from us by the darkness 
and to make up for time lost over the broken axle of a cart which we had been obliged that day to leave by the roadside the oxen were inspanned next morning whilst it was still dark and we started on trek before dawn the bulgarian driver is compared to the kaffir boy strangely noiseless and the only sound as the little procession moved off into the darkness was squish squish as the wheels of the swaying carts forced their way through the quagmires of mud which marked the track there was no moon and the stars weary with what they had seen of the ways of men disappeared from view one by one and left us to the darkness between the two great silences and now that the big guns were quieted for a few hours of night there was over all the world a peace that peace which passeth all understanding the peace which precedes the dawn and then away in the eastern horizon the blackness gave place furtively to a faint grey light which spread slowly and reluctantly till all the world was grey ah there was no help for it the day must come i glanced back along the grey outline of that little procession in single file of our ox-carts and wished i could have painted my impression of the picture revealed by the light of that grey dawn grey carts white oxen led in silence by bulgarian and turkish peasants also grey and white with their grey clothing and white navushtas defiling between the grey rocks of a narrow gorge and freighted not with turkish or bulgarian merchandise but with british women who themselves emblematic of the dawn of a new day had without thought of fear or of discomfort thrown off the shackles of civilization and were jolting peacefully towards a turkish town there to render service to those in need betwixt odalisk and woman's convoy corps what an interval we were now nearing our journey's end and on the evening of that day a glad surprise awaited us we had already outspanned for the night in a particularly unsavoury farmyard in the little village of jenergy garrisoned at the moment by some five hundred troops i was looking round with a hopeful eye for chickens when an officer came up and saluting brought a message from his c o inviting us all to come into the little cafe and have a cup of coffee the invitation though kind didn't sound very nourishing but we gratefully accepted and crowded into the tiny room about twelve feet square which had been cleared of soldiers who were smoking and drinking to make space for us with eyes fixed upon a dark inner room from which supplies might not unreasonably be expected to emerge we all sat round two long empty tables whilst the officers evidently glad of a little social diversion stood round and chatted with us there was probably a hungry look in our eyes for in a few minutes the truth i am thankful to say leaked out that we were starving and with one accord the officers insisted that we must eat the soup which had just been prepared for the evening meal and was now about to be served in their own quarters close at hand i think i tried to remonstrate but was horribly conscious of half-heartedness and in a few minutes plates of delicious-looking soup full of thick chunks of meat and vegetables were being offered us by those blessed officers and their orderlies i shall never forget the sudden silence which followed the placing of those plates of soup upon the table in front of us we remembered that meal intimately for it was the last we had worthy of mention till we arrived at our destination two days later in our impatience to get to work those last two days seemed interminable but even at the rate of one and a half kilometres an hour the trek which had lasted seven days came to an end at last and our cortege drew up as usual in a manure yard outside kirk Kilis, called by the bulgarians lozengrad the town of the vines each one of us eager to start upon our mission End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen it was one o'clock when the oxen and buffaloes were unyoked in the mud trampled encampment by the side of the road on the outskirts of the town my business now was to find the commandant and receive orders to find also as i hoped my good friend dr kiranoff the drivers were told to wait in camp till my return and i together with the senior doctor and the senior sister and an interpreter marched off into the town it was i was sorry to know sunday and the office of the commandant might possibly be closed we discovered his headquarters and found that he was away was the pmo in the town no he was away at chatalja for a moment my heart sank had no work then been arranged for us after all i decided that the commandant must at all cost be unearthed i could not contemplate losing half a day before getting to work i was besides anxious to get the corps away from that foul encampment before night if possible 
where i asked was the commandant cross-examination disclosed the fact that he was as i suspected lunching at the military club he would return later but i had my doubts about that return as it was sunday we therefore went to the military club this was very carefully guarded and there was some difficulty in persuading the sentries to let us through but we were finally admitted in the entrance hall and i was able to send a message to the commandant who was i was thankful to find under the same roof he sent a courteous reply that he would return at once to his office and hoped to see me there in a few moments we returned therefore and before long the commandant was safely in my presence i asked for orders these were simple we were to go through the town and select for ourselves any houses we thought suitable for conversion into hospitals and set to work at once there were thousands of additional wounded hourly expected from chatalja and help would be sorely needed i had expected that perhaps the buildings would have been already selected but i of course acquiesced without comment and if i asked the houses we should select should chance to be inhabited what are we to do turn out the inhabitants was the answer all right i replied as though it were part of my daily routine to walk through turkish towns turning the inhabitants out of their own houses but before we start to work could you direct us i asked to a restaurant we're a little hungry and i want the members of our mission to get some food as soon as possible he very kindly sent one of his officers with us as a guide and told him to take us to the best restaurant in town the guide who talked very incomplete french took us through narrow muddy irregularly cobbled streets to this best restaurant alas the shutters were up and the place closed but our guide knocked at the door for some time there was no reply but eventually in response to a fist cannonade from our united forces the door was opened and a surly-looking man apparently as our guide informed us a greek muttered some words in a language none of us understood pointed to the shutters shrugged his shoulders and shut the door in our faces it's sunday and feeding time is over said the guide laconically but we'll try elsewhere we tried at every elsewhere in kirk Kilis with the same negative result i'm sorry then said our guide but i can do no more you must wait till to-morrow adieu and he left us but i had no intention of waiting till to-morrow i pictured all my comrades in the carts eagerly waiting for us to return and conduct them to the promised land of food and plenty i was glad things looked so desperate for i knew this would be the moment for the miracle and the miracle of course happened straight away i glanced down the street wondering what to do next when lo and behold just appearing round the corner and now marching straight toward us with that free and easy swing so suggestive of power and self-confidence two officers dressed in our own blessed khaki uniform do ask them to help us whispered one of my companions i knew these officers would understand so i went up to them explained who we were told them we were anxious to select our hospital buildings before night but wanted to have some food first would they like angels help us to get this i should think we would replied emphatically the taller of the two who turned out to be the british military attache why certainly right here corroborated the other who was the american military attache and i knew all would be well now they went back to the first best restaurant and knocked as we had knocked with the same result a surly face a finger pointing at the shutters and shrugged shoulders you refuse to give these ladies food inquired our friends you have but they were talking to closed doors all right muttered the officers you're up against something different this time my friend we'll soon see if you'll provide food or not our attaches straightway went back into the main street which was swarming with soldiers soldiers on their way to the front soldiers wounded returning from the front soldiers soldiers everywhere and collected at haphazard half a dozen stalwart specimens the british attache then gave the command fix bayonets returned with his escort to the restaurant stormed the door forced it open and made the soldiers stand inside with their bayonets fixed ready for action now will you give these ladies food or not asked our british officer quietly of the restaurant keeper with eyes fixed uneasily on the gleaming bayonets the man replied sulkily we would if we had it but we've none left it's sunday it's all finished 
but from my position at the door i'd been looking round and my eyes had spotted a cupboard underneath the counter but what i asked have you got then in that cupboard i'm sure you have eggs there i sniffed loudly i can smell eggs in that cupboard open the cupboard commanded the officer it was full of eggs with the bayonets pointing at him the restaurant keeper was made to take out some eggs and followed by the soldiers and the bayonets the attaches and ourselves our host proceeded to the kitchen where the eggs were very promptly converted into omelettes and i can guarantee that omelette a la bayonette is a dish for epicures the officers stayed with us while we lunched and kindly invited us to have tea with them later at their quarters then after i and my companions had sent word to the corps to come up and get some food we returned to the office of the commandant ready for anything the task before us was simple we were given an official guide who knew the town and had a list of the commandierable houses and we set off on our errand the mud was in places a foot deep and together with the painfully irregular projecting cobbles demanded under ordinary circumstances careful steering with eyes upon the ground but i was wearing long practically heelless rubber boots which were mud and cobble proof and i was able though with difficulty owing to the crowded condition of the narrow streets to keep critical eyes upon the houses on either side as we walked along i came to the conclusion after the first five minutes that unless the outside of those dirty impossible-looking houses belied their interior possibilities as hospital wards the commandant must be playing a practical joke upon us in telling us to select houses suitable for hospitals i less and less appreciated the idea of having presently to dive into one of those uncanny-looking interiors and turn out the inmates neck and crop but it was no good shivering on the brink the plunge must be taken i wish to enter that house i therefore told the guide as i saw through the open doorway of a small courtyard a dingy unsavoury tumble-down house on the other side of the quadrangle it was i thought at least a little bit away from the street ah yes that was a turkish hotel and very suitable our guide thought we accordingly crossed the little yard and ascended a dark narrow staircase leading up to the house itself we opened the door of the best room the house contained it was about ten feet square with low ceiling no fireplace or ventilation the windows were closed an iron stove was burning fiercely and from twenty to thirty turkish soldiers were squatting playing cards or lying asleep on the floor the dirt and the smells were a revelation of possibilities these are turkish prisoners they can go elsewhere if you want the house intimated the guide thank you but i shall not be wanting this house i replied but for educational purposes we looked over the other rooms and inspected the save the mark sanitary arrangements then having received our first never to be forgotten lesson in turkish sanitation we emerged once more thankfully into the outer air realizing that our british standards would have to be considerably readjusted if we were to succeed in adapting ourselves to turkish environment the remainder of the afternoon provided us with a varied experience of turkish interiors each house we entered seeming to be a little more unsuited for our purpose than the last we had entered and discarded as impossible house after house with no prospect apparently of anything more suitable turning up it was therefore now obviously time for the miracle the best i told myself was being kept as a surprise till the last and so it was suddenly we entered a side street looking quite different to the rest the street though as usual nameless was a little broader and more airy and the houses were modern and comparatively new almost at once we pounced upon two houses one storied facing each other on opposite sides of the street as suitable for our purpose as we were likely to find they had been private houses occupied by turkish families as evidenced by the harem casements and the crescent over the doors and must have belonged to people who were well to do for there were good-sized entrance halls downstairs and some of the rooms were comparatively large the only present occupants were some convalescent soldiers thankful to find even the shelter of an empty house for it contained nothing of any sort but dirt we told the soldiers they must turn out to-morrow at sunrise it was too late unfortunately now to start on the augean cleaning task as these houses could not contain the staff who were in any case better separately housed we searched further 
and found in an adjoining street another empty house in which we arranged to put up bedsteads for ourselves hugely thankful at the result in the end of our afternoon's work we made our way back to the famous restaurant to arrange as we grandly hoped for supper for the party but once more we found that we were too late at such short notice the restaurant people though quite polite could not give food to so large a number but we had secured our hospital building and nothing else mattered in comparison we therefore went to our good friends the military attaches to tell them the result of our afternoon's work and to get our promised cup of tea they were just going out to dinner at the military club but they gave us tea and biscuits and then most kindly rummaged their lockers and found odd tins of meat which they generously insisted on our carrying with us to the camp so we returned to the rest of our expectant party lighted our fires and ate our supper sitting on the shafts of the ox-carts on ground that was in spadish language a manure heap in spite of all disadvantages however we were all full of hope and good spirits for to-morrow our real work would begin End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the next morning at daybreak all was astir in the little camp our escort had disappeared but some of the corps remained to superintend the inspanning of the oxen which were to convey luggage and equipment on their last short stage to the doors of the hospital whilst the remainder took in charge the cleaning of the hospital houses the commandant put at our disposal during our stay in kirk Kilis a young infantry lieutenant then convalescent from wounds received during the war he spoke french and his duty would be to requisition for us all that we should require in the way of food and other necessaries we were also presented with a dozen bulgarian soldiers and reservists to act as orderlies for carrying water scrubbing digging trenches or for doing any odd jobs for which our small staff could ill be spared before the work of cleaning the hospital houses could be begun however water pails cloths scrubbing brushes and soap had first to be procured the water supply in a pump in our back yard was too impure we were told to be used for any purpose we had therefore to seal the pump and find water elsewhere we fortunately discovered some in the yard of a house farther down the street pails well there were none in kirk Calice and empty paraffin tins had to be found and converted into water carriers cloths we made hurriedly out of sacks from which blankets and stores were being emptied and scrubbing brushes and soap the lieutenant when he arrived was able to requisition from somewhere and the work was at last set going the soldiers had obviously never seen a scrubbing brush before a broom made of twigs for sweeping dust being the nearest approach to a floor cleaning weapon with which they were familiar the amazement on their faces when they were told to follow our example and go down on their hands and knees and use water brushes soap and cloth was worth watching the larger of the two houses destined to be the main hospital contained on the ground floor a large entrance hall from this there opened on the right a room used by me as an office and place in which to receive officials and visitors to the hospital the kitchen opened out of the hall at the farther end and a scullery beyond led into the back yard on the left side of the hall and near the entrance doors was the surgery and outpatients room a tiny storeroom lay beyond and beyond that was a small room used at first as a dining room for the staff we eventually deserted this room because it was permeated with essence of cesspool which stagnated just outside the window and we screened off a portion of the outer hall as a mess room upstairs there was a broad corridor which made an excellent ward and was always full not only with bed patients but with others who had to lie on straw mattresses on the floor the beds being all in use and the four rooms which were used as wards also a surgical storeroom opened into this corridor there was a turkish lavatory upstairs and one downstairs but of course no bathroom the stairs were circular and particularly ill-adapted for the conveyance of stretchers the house opposite was more or less similarly arranged and contained a bright good-sized room which we used as a theatre for operations as we had been warned of the possible early arrival in kirk Kilis of a large convoy of wounded from chatalja we made superhuman efforts to be ready for them and simultaneously whilst some of the party attended to the cleaning arrangements scrubbed the floors and scoured the walls and ceilings 
others unpacked the huge cases of blankets bed garments linen and stores which were unloaded from the ox wagons whilst the cooking staff prepared the kitchen the sisters arranged the surgical necessaries in readiness for immediate use and the doctors prepared the surgery and outpatients room on that first night the restaurant keeper had graciously vouchsafed to give us supper due notice having been given for our own kitchen arrangements were of course not yet in working order and after supper we were more than ready for bed but beds were not ready for us some of the light portable iron bedsteads brought from sophia had been duly carried to our sleeping-house in which we had four unfurnished rooms but at nine o'clock the straw ordered for filling the mattresses had not arrived and we were preparing to sleep upon the bare floor when behold as usual the miracle unbeknown to us and whilst we were supping mr noel buxton and his brother who had returned to kirk Kilis after their interesting tour with the military staff went off on their own and just as we were arriving at our night quarters to go to floor in the empty house these two splendid people arrived at the door in the shafts of carts which they had themselves dragged full of straw from somewhere then everybody helped everybody else to fill their mattresses and pillows and after an hour's exhilarating scrimmage in the dark for turkish streets are never lighted we retired to what might have been but for rats the best night's rest we had had for many a long day there were not even packing cases for use as bedroom furniture these were all needed in the hospital but we learnt to do excellently without such superfluities we could also have done without the rats which waited until tired out we fell asleep and then darted out from their holes and ran about not only over our beds but also bold libertines over our faces their motives were however as we soon discovered obviously pious for we found them running off with such few treasures soap and toothbrushes as we possessed thus in scriptural fashion they took from those who had not even that little which they had but we had no time to worry over trifles such as rats early the next morning we eagerly resumed our hospital preparations we had immediately realized the importance of establishing at once an outpatient's department for already rumors of the new hospital had spread and the narrow street was crowded not only with curious onlookers but with bandaged soldiers with wounds of every variety who crowded round the doors clamoring for treatment which the other hospitals in the congested condition of affairs were unable to provide with splendid enthusiasm the three doctors set to work to get the surgery going and before the first day was over the wounds of some dozen of the more clamorous had already been dressed and on the afternoon of the second day whilst the cleaning of the houses was still in progress whilst piles of packing-cases in the halls were being emptied then carried into the back yard and converted into benches and tables whilst blankets sheets crockery surgical necessaries stores etc were being distributed for surgery ward kitchen or for personal use whilst beds were being carried upstairs and fixed whilst sack mattresses were being made the ends sewn up a slit cut in the middle straw inserted and the slit sewn over whilst all this was still going on seventy-one outpatients were treated in the dispensary and on that same afternoon just before dusk ox wagons drew up at the doors with five severely wounded soldiers craving admission as inpatients they were suffering respectively from complicated fracture of the femur and from general bullet wounds and one from tetanus though all was still in confusion these men could not be refused for was not this emergency work the work we had come to do with lightning rapidity a ward was prepared iron bedsteads fixed and beds made with new blankets and white sheets and pillow-cases and by the time the carts were unloaded and the stretchers had been safely carried up the stairs the sisters in their neat linen frocks white caps and aprons their bulgarian red cross badges on their arm were waiting in the wards with everything ready to receive their first patients thus within forty-eight hours from the time of the arrival of the convoy corps in kirk Kilis, their hospital was a going concern it was dark at five but the work of unpacking and sorting and cleaning was continued by those who were not needed in the wards by the light of candles stuck in bottles as no oil was available and lamps could not yet be requisitioned it was nine o'clock that evening when a halt was called for supper the buxton brothers who had looked in to offer help were with us and we had just sat down to a meal of bully beef in our smelly little dining-room when i was summoned to the entrance hall 
there stood an official with a familiar red cross badge upon his arm he saluted then pointing outside into the darkness said we have here fifty wounded soldiers they have come in springless ox carts from chataldra their wounds have been unattended for six days can you take them in we moved to the door as he spoke and down the unlighted street and dimly definable in the darkness stretched as far as the eye could penetrate an unbroken line of ox wagons they were now stationary the leading wagon drawn up in front of our hospital door the drivers had dismounted and stood beside their oxen patiently waiting for orders nothing was visible of the freight of human wreckage inside the wagons all was silent underneath those wicker hoods but i knew that fifty human beings huddled together in horrible discomfort were in suffering and torture mutely appealing to us to help them can you take them in repeated the red cross official of course i can i replied without hesitation that's what we're here for i knew we were not in the strict sense of the word ready for them but our rough improvised comforts would at least be better for them than their present deplorable condition i knew also that the admission to the wards of all these seriously wounded men must in the present state of our arrangements entail a heavy strain upon our little staff but i knew that reliance could be placed on their loyalty to their cause which is the cause of the sick and wounded and that zeal and enthusiasm would pull them through i went back to the dining-room there are fifty seriously wounded soldiers outside they have come six days in ox carts from chataldra they are waiting for us to bring them in was all that had to be said mr buxton who knew that everybody had worked without ceasing for two days with no time to recover from fatigues incidental to the seven days trek remonstrated in vain that i should be overtaxing the strength of the staff the logic of man had no chance against the intuition of woman the doctors with fine spirits said they would tackle it sisters nurses and cooks corroborated and in a moment the supper-table was deserted and everybody was in the street taking a share in the work of conveying the wounded men from those cruel ox-carts to the wards during the rest of our lives none of us will ever probably again be as busy as we were during those next few hours for the carts must be unloaded and the wounded must be quickly diagnosed and distributed appropriately to the nature of the wounds or the fever from which they were suffering and placed under the care of doctors sisters nurses orderlies and interpreters in the various wards of the two respective houses whilst inside the nurses hurriedly fixed iron bedsteads and filled mattresses with straw the removal without injury of the badly wounded over the immovable tailboards and front pieces of those particularly inappropriate ox-carts on to stretchers by dim candlelight was no easy matter the darkness added greatly to the difficulty for nothing could of course be elicited from the patients as to the nature of their wounds without the interpreters who at critical moments would be whisked off to attend to some other urgent case and be hopelessly lost in the crowd of soldiers and curiosity mongers who as usual collected and added to the general hubbub but the most serious consideration was a lack of straw for the mattresses we could manage without a sufficiency of beds if we had enough mattresses to put upon the floor the straw that had been ordered and promised had not arrived and at nine p m it was not likely to turn up there was i knew nothing like enough straw to give each man something soft to lie on this was desperate straw must by hook or by crook be instantly procured i saw an official with an intelligent sympathetic face standing amongst the crowd looking on idly i took him by the coat-sleeve look here i said in one language after another till i found one which suited him you see all these wounded they are your fellow countrymen we must house them to-night we have no straw for mattresses get some for mercy's sake he nodded and went off and i thought all was well i only learnt afterwards that a bulgarian nod means a negative a shake of the head an affirmative a few minutes later i saw standing on the same spot an official whom i thought was my late friend there apparently he still stood having done nothing and straw this night we must have i spoke with some heat this is really too bad have you done nothing where to goodness is that straw i remonstrated can't you see the urgency you promised me faithfully you and looking up into his face which was a long way up i saw that by the dim light i had made a mistake this was not my former friend 
from under the curled and dark mustachios on a handsome face a voice replied with haughtiness in the italian language madame it is not one of my duties to fetch and carry straw why not i replied impatiently who are you he smiled madame i am the italian military attache oh that is splendid i said much relieved i thought you were only an ordinary man but as you hold such a high position of authority you will be able to help me all the better you see all these wounded they must have straw for mattresses to-night it is late and except by a miracle such as you we oui. madame he interrupted straw you shall have if there is any within ten miles of lozengrad i haven't the slightest notion how straw is made or where it comes from but i am at your service he moved off with a business-like air and the straw by his orders arrived soon afterwards there can be no doubt whatever that military attaches are an excellent institution no war must ever be without them war correspondents too when they're not corresponding are likewise good inventions the correspondent of the morning post mr fox who chanced to be walking down the street lent us a kindly hand and was of great assistance in helping us to carry in the wounded the buxton brothers who had themselves been working hard all day in the bulgarian hospital were also invaluable and within a couple of hours that freight of human remnants shattered in legs arms heads everywhere had all been removed from the carts and carried on stretchers or hand seats up the inconvenient staircase to the different wards here the sisters took the patients in charge and distributed them the more severely injured in the beds as far as these were available and when these gave out the weary wounded were placed on sack mattresses in the halls corridors outhouses in every available space and their tattered blood-stained garments which were often glued to the wounds were removed and put in bundles and numbered for subsequent recognition wounds were then dressed and the soldiers clothed in new bed-shirts and linen drawers and safely tucked up in comfortable sheets and blankets enjoyed before settling for the night good plates of soup which the cooks had cleverly managed to produce thus before the end of the second day in our improvised hospital our wards were not only full but overflowing and the work of the hospital was in full swing in all departments end of chapter fourteen chapters fifteen and sixteen of war and women by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen two of the patients were turks these were when first admitted very nervous one of them looking round cautiously whispered timorously to the nurse when are they going to kill me though the question was capable of an alternative interpretation we took it as an inference of the treatment likely to be bestowed by his own nation on his enemies but he soon became friendly and later played games of cards with his wardmates quite happily and from that first night any doubt which may have ever existed in my mind as to the wisdom of allowing british women to nurse and doctor bulgarian and turkish soldiers was dispelled the men both turks and bulgarians gratefully acknowledged that never before had they been so well or so carefully tended whilst our own doctors and nurses declared that amongst the many whom they had treated at home no patients had ever shown greater courtesy chivalry and delicacy than was shown by these balkan peasant soldiers the following day a further contingent of wounded was admitted and i was fortunate in being able to find a few yards farther down the street another house which was empty and unoccupied except for waif and stray soldiers it was therefore immediately annexed and cleaned mattresses were placed upon the floor of the four good-sized rooms and the house was thenceforth used as an overflow hospital for the less serious cases the theatre already looked very neat and businesslike it had been fitted with an operating table and a couple of instrument tables made by two slow-handed old bulgarian carpenters who were commandeered for our service and who it must be confessed worked only under compulsion but our own staff could not now be spared for outside work and there were many carpentering jobs which were essential for the comfort of the patients the question of ventilation of the wards was a crucial one the soldiers had an ingrained horror of fresh air and determinedly closed every window or door immediately the nurses backs were turned remembering how i had adversely criticised the atmosphere in some of the other hospitals i had visited i made up my mind that something drastic should be done this resolution was brought to a climax on the second day when a particularly gangrenous smelling wound was being dressed 
the patients had as usual remonstrated at the open windows and for the moment while the dressing was going on these had all been closed i therefore opened one of the sash windows twelve inches at the bottom summoned the carpenters showed them a plank which i had measured and sawn and told them to nail this across the opening to shut out the air and to do the same to all the windows of all the rooms in all the houses it is of course a well-known plan but the soldiers unaware that ventilation was secured by the free passage of air between the upper and lower sashes imagined that the piece of wood had been thoughtfully nailed across to keep out draughts and they were gratified in any case they could no longer shut the windows and my object was attained unfortunately i found that some of the windows in some of the rooms were constructed on a different plan and the little ruse seemed frustrated for half a moment when i discovered this i was checkmated but a suggestive broom with a nice long handle stood near and after sending someone to make sure that there was nobody in the street below i swept the cobwebs from the upper panes and the broom clumsily went through the glass glaziers a particularly patriotic class were of course all at the front so those windows wasn't it tiresome never could get mended but the question of sanitation was to me of most serious concern it is impossible here to describe in detail the difficulties which had to be conquered turkish sanitary arrangements when seen for the first time are under any circumstances enough to make curled hair stand on end but commonplace horror was intensified by the fact that we were housing seventy to eighty people in houses intended for the accommodation of a couple of dozen there were no drains but a thoughtfully planned pipe carried the excretia from upstairs past the bedroom windows down the wall of the house to a cesspool into which you could step from the dining-room window for it lay snugly just alongside and underneath and was only partially covered with rotten planks left loose purposely for convenience in removal new cesspools had occasionally to be dug and as this was not a job for which there was overdue competition amongst the soldier orderlies nor one which they understood it was necessary to stand over them and direct them as to the length and breadth and direction of the channels etc and face the typhoid foe as they themselves would face the turk but the discipline was as i told myself wholesome even though that word were not strictly applicable to the process all situations are interesting if you can either feel their significance or see their humour when significance and humour both stare you in the face life is a regalement but in addition to cesspools trenches had a course to be dug in the small back yards for kitchen refuse and dirty water and other purposes the orderlies were unaccustomed to so many invidious distinctions and constant supervision was therefore necessary this was the more important because all refuse carts and scavengers were at the front and one was obliged literally to keep one's own sty clean the disposal of soiled dressings was also for the first few days a little troublesome as they would not burn in the open trenches during the rain and in any case the yard was too small and the odour too noxious for the process so near the house to be desirable but i obtained leave to build a brick incinerator on a piece of enclosed vacant land a little farther down the street and this considerably relieved matters for the first fortnight it was impossible to leave the hospital even for a quarter of an hour there was more than enough to do in organization and in coordination of the various departments which were all understaffed for the work in hand it was necessary also to be on the spot in case of eventualities the arrival of new cases necessitated nearly every day readjustment of the wards the more seriously wounded must be given beds in the main blocks whilst the less serious cases would be sent to block c as convalescents or possibly to be put on the list for return either to their homes in bulgaria or to the front very soon too a fourth hospital house became necessary and for a time we were housing feeding and treating ninety-two inpatients in addition to the outpatients this was as many as the staff could undertake for unfortunately most of them myself excepted succumbed to slight attacks of fever similar in character to what used to be known as low fever and were in turn incapacitated for a week or ten days at a time but their illnesses were thoughtfully arranged to take place in succession and as more than two were never at any given time hors de combat the work was at no moment disorganized the authorities had kindly put at my disposal a young bulgarian student to act as secretary he was in normal times newspaper correspondent at st petersburg and talked french 
for the names and regimental numbers of the sick and wounded together with the nature of the wounds or sickness had to be registered for official purposes also notification and lists had to be made of those who were sufficiently recovered to be sent again to the front and of convalescents who could be returned to their homes all this together with any official correspondence which might be necessary was of course conducted in the bulgarian language of which the letters are written like the russian in cyrillic characters a mischievous invention of cyril and methodius in the ninth century the bulgarian language is not difficult to learn but there was no time just then for mastering linguistic technicalities besides if you learnt the bulgarian or indeed any other human language you weren't much forwarder in thrace it only prolonged the agony of inarticulation i once for instance addressed in my best bulgarian a woman who clothed in the garments of a bulgarian peasant was standing near me in the shop in response she turned her head away much disappointed i looked to the shopkeeper for an explanation he then told me in french that this woman though she always dressed like a bulgarian was really a greek but that she could speak only turkish concentrated essence of tower of babel i muttered in despair as i left the shop amongst other duties one had in the office to sign all the requisition orders for meat bread vegetables firewood or other necessaries and be at hand in case of emergencies the question of the safe arrival in time for the men's dinner of the bread and meat and vegetables caused every day moments of dramatic tension on occasions when dinner-time had come and some important ingredient of the dinner was still delaying it was comforting to the cook to have someone to come to who was supposed to be able to do something there wasn't really anything to be done on such occasions but time passes quicker if something is apparently in operation and one could flutter wings and fly around and send messengers dashing in all directions sometimes if things looked extra desperate and a day of fasting seemed imminent i would go round the wards with sticks of chocolate which had been presented to the corps and remind the soldiers that there happened to be a war going on outside and that little inconveniences of that nature had a tendency to make bullocks and sheep a little slow on trek and bakers who were all working under military regime a little casual in their routine and by that time the food would have arrived the dinner would be ready and the reputation of the hospital saved but as a rule all went on oiled wheels though shopping was a little impeded by a somewhat unusual concatenation of circumstances kirk Kilisse is a tiny town with only about half a mile of shopping area available even before the war but within this small area most of the previously existing shops were now closed because their turkish owners had fled whilst of those still open some were kept by greeks some by bulgarians some by jews of various nationalities and some few again by turks with the result that in every week there were at least three sundays three separate days that is on which either the mohammedan or the jewish or the christian shops would be closed but further as each religion had of course in addition special to its church its own fast days on which days also its shops would be shut and as no shop was ever open between twelve and two or before nine or after four when it was dusk and respectable people were supposed to be indoors shopping in kirk Kilisse was somewhat of a losing hazard and required for successful achievement not only memory and patience and linguistic accomplishments but knowledge of ecclesiastical lore in theory these difficulties may appear formidable but in practice they were non important owing to the fact that nothing that you ever wanted was ever contained in any of the shops and on the whole it saved time and other things to assume with polite euphemism that to-day the shops were shut as time wore on a few more shops were opened and a few commodities such as sugar though not necessarily for public sale put in an appearance one day penka one of our girl interpreters came in with the good news that in one of the shops there was now a little sugar should we like some jam to be made there was no fruit either fresh or dried but one of the shopkeepers had some dried rose leaves and he would make us some jam out of these and this romantic and excellent preserve was for the short time that it lasted a most welcome substitute for beef dripping on brown bread End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen it would no doubt have been better for the peace of mind of our staff if we could have adopted the same euphemistic attitude towards the post office that we adopted towards the shops and have assumed that it too was permanently closed 
i was personally not much worried as i had arranged to have no letters forwarded from home i could not in any case have deserted my work and i did not want to be enervated by external worries but those who were expecting to hear from home two or three times a week and who knew that letters and parcels were being regularly dispatched were naturally at first each day full of expectation if there was a post-office in working order the hope that letters might be received was reasonable until you had peeped behind the scenes and then the wonder was that anything should ever be received at all there was no delivery of letters you were supposed to call for the post the office was a good building which had been used till the bulgarian occupation of kirkilis as post office by the turks the debris of the old turkish office torn up postal orders letters of credit old account books still littered the street and pavement just outside ankle deep inside a brand new bulgarian post office staff was in charge their procedure was as follows during the few hours of the postal working day a certain number very limited number of mail bags would be dealt with and if you were fortunate enough to enter the post office at a moment when a bag containing letters for yourself was being sorted you stood a chance of being able if you were agile to snatch them and make off with them but the sorters were new to their job and in some cases could only read the bulgarian cyrillic characters letters addressed therefore in the old-fashioned latin type stood small chance of being recognized and identified but as it was further impossible within the few working hours available each day nine to twelve and two to six to deal with all the bags and arrears of bags that arrived in a single day the sorters had an ingenious method of treatment they would sort out as many letters from as many bags as they could get through without worrying themselves and then if a post bag was not emptied when closing time came so much the worse for that post bag it had lost its chance and was thenceforth banished to a dark and uninhabited back room a new day dealt with new bags and a sportive element of chance thus enveloped all communication from the outer world sometimes however and these were gala days j who was post courier and treasurer for the corps would be allowed to have a sacred half hour amongst the dead in that abandoned back room and from amongst the masses of literary debris which strewed the floor would extract epistolary trophies of ancient date from the old country and emerge triumphant outgoing letters and telegrams had of course to run the gauntlet of the censor this meant sometimes hours of waiting in the long queue till it was your turn to present your letter and give details of the contents of the communication here also ignorance on the part of some of the officials of any language but the bulgarian had a restraining influence on the output for the censor would only pass letters and telegrams that were written in a language which he could understand and in a calligraphy which he could read this latter condition irrevocably precluded me during my sojourn in the balkans from communicating with my friends i bore this with resignation on the assumption that i could in emergency communicate with them by means of the non-committal telegram but here again i was checkmate for the postal authorities refused to send cables to countries of which they had never heard and as the bulgarian ignorance of general geography is almost as profound as the british ignorance of balkan geography my only method of communicating with for instance british columbia and nigeria was by cable via friends in london but even when letters did eventuate the news contained in them seemed strangely insipid accounts of motor drives over flawless macadam roads of dinner parties at which as you knew course after course of every delicacy in season or out of season would have been automatically handed round and have been probably for the most part horrible thought as automatically refused how dull seemed the alternative between champagne and claret compared to the choice between water or no drink at all or between impure water and nothing and with this we were sometimes threatened for our drinking water was obtained from a well in a house a few doors farther down the street the water in the pumps in our own yards being obviously contaminated and unusable for any purpose but one evening the orderly who had gone as usual to fetch water did not return and there was no water to fill the kettles and the cooking pots a hunt was instituted and presently cuckoo was found squatting composedly on the floor in one of the wards warming his hands at the stove an interpreter was fetched and cuckoo was asked why he had not done his duty and brought the water as usual to the kitchen did he not know that water was needed to cook the soldiers dinner he looked up in innocent surprise 
i could not bring water the door was locked and there was no key it was also sealed but and he looked into the comforting stove again perhaps to-morrow the door will be open the door was open to-morrow but it was not opened by warming our hands at the stove the door did not open by itself the history of the well and of the house and of its owner had immediately to be ascertained it was found that the owner had for political reasons been expelled last night by the government who had then taken the keys and sealed the house our lieutenant had then to be dispatched post haste to the commandant to ask for leave to have the keys in our own possession this was eventually granted but in the meantime a temporary water supply had to be discovered we were fortunate in finding a well in another street not too far away and this little difficulty vanished but in addition to the superintendence of innumerable details and adjustment of minor difficulties such as this it was necessary to be on the spot also to receive the various visitors generals medical directors inspectors and officials of all kinds who took the closest interest in our work general dragonoff the king's chamberlain honoured us on several occasions with a visit and reported to king ferdinand in flattering terms upon our improvised hospital madame daneff wife of the minister who was subsequently delegate at the peace conference in london also came to see us and later at christmas time gave us a welcome present of some bottles of wine dr kiranoff when he returned from chatalja was of course specially interested in coming often to witness as he kindly put it the justification of his faith he together with his able and kindly assistant dr ivanoff and our old friends the british and american and italian attaches were often welcome to our tea-table i am never likely to forget those teas amongst the many various duties which fell to my lot as directress of the women's convoy corps hospital at kirk Calice, i found none so difficult to manipulate in accordance with any standard of success as those five o'clock sit-down teas with staff and visitors in our mephitic little dining-room for the only chance of diverting the nostrils of our visitors from the pungent essence of cesspool with which our refectory was redolent was to rivet the attention of the guests upon the conversation but to maintain this at a sufficiently absorbing degree of brilliancy was not easy with the exception of colonel lyon the british attache who talked good french english officers you could take for granted would speak no language but their own of the bulgarian officers some could speak in addition to their own only french others only german others again only bulgarian whilst an occasional greek friend or a plenipotentiary from the russian hospital would emit a hopscotch of all the combined languages of europe and it was a juggler's feat to keep these different language balls all flying at once if one ball dropped sniff sniff all round the table would i knew be chorused by inquisitive noses which unfortunately all sniffed in esperanto i was thankful after the armistice had been declared and the scrimmage of outpatients awaiting in the hall their turn for treatment in the surgery was less when we were able to abandon our horrid little stink-hole and take our meals in the screened-off portion of the entrance hall End of chapter sixteen chapters seventeen eighteen and nineteen of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen surmises amongst visitors who had not previously known us as to who and what the convoy corps are in england were often quite interesting as a revelation of the knowledge possessed on the continent of english societies one day for instance we were honoured by a visit from the lady who was superintendent of the wards of one of the foreign red cross missions in kirk Calice for foreign red cross missions other than the british had brought women nurses she was a particularly well cultured woman and spoke in excellent english she introduced herself to me and then said i am most interested in your organization madame stobart you are the suffragette are you not i was beginning to explain that we were not when she interrupted apologetically ah uh, no no i am stupid i know of course you are the salvation army the suffragettes and the salvation army the only two societies in england yet recognized on the continent of europe brass bands and advertisement not without results another of our visitors was the cheery old bishop of Starazagora. he came with an attendant priest and brought for the soldiers a most welcome gift of cigarettes 
up till that time it had been impossible to procure tobacco and the patients had been clamouring for a smoke he also brought for us women not scent or sweetmeats but a gift of extra good tobacco for cigarettes and some good old madeira like wine our wounded had not been before visited by clergy i had made inquiries and found that it was not desired by the soldiers they would i was told have thought it was a signal of immediate death for all had a priest appeared in the wards the bishop merely walked through the wards distributing the cigarettes and an occasional blessing as he passed from bed to bed nothing in the nature of a prayer was offered he was a cheery old fellow and full of pluck was on his way to visit the cholera camp at chatalja our hospital kept mercifully free from cholera though patients might of course have been infected before entrance to our wards and sixteen patients died from cholera in the infectious hospital in the street next to us we were not supposed to take infectious cases but after the armistice had been declared and no more fighting was taking place medical cases became more frequent and needed careful watching not only for cholera but also for typhoid and a so-called malarial fever both epidemic the authorities had however early taken precautions against an outbreak of cholera i had been summoned to a conference of the heads of hospitals three days after our arrival in kirkkilis and precautionary measures were then discussed and subsequently put in force the conference was held in the offices of the commission sanitaire the president was dr romanoff and the practical director professor kraus the room was as usual much overheated by one of those unmanageable stoves which either emit too much heat and suffocate you or if checked sulk and go out altogether leaving you to an arctic temperature i was more than ever convinced at this conference that the site of the tower of babel had been in thrace for the babelian game was in full swing the foreign missions in kirkilis were represented and everybody talked at once in every conceivable language this might have been all very well if everybody had understood every language but as the majority could speak one language only and that imperfectly it was marvellous how any business was transacted i reflected on the incongruity of the spectacle twentieth century human beings denizens of a much vaunted civilization met together to discuss problems of life and death unable to communicate their thoughts if half the money that has been spent by man in devising materials for the destruction of man had been expended in devising means for verbal intercourse between man and man the desire for mutual destruction would probably have vanished long ago has not the tower of babel period of confusion in language and ideas lasted long enough when will come the pentecost our hospital visitors were always much interested in noting the cleanliness of the wards for this was as they knew a result not too easily achieved improvised spittoons in the shape of open saucers made of red pottery loomed largely but the patients had a playful habit of throwing bones and scraps of food on the floor at meal times and cleanliness was only attained by night and day efforts but in their persons the bulgarian soldiers were extraordinarily cleanly their first craving on admission to hospital was always to be washed specially to have their feet washed if for any reason the every morning routine all over wash was delayed even for a quarter of an hour it was a grievance when they were convalescent enough to be able to wash themselves this was an operation which they thoroughly enjoyed the condition of cleanliness in which they arrived notwithstanding all they had endured was marvellous and i am always a disappointment to friends who desire to hear titillating stories of animal life in the balkans much interest was taken by our visitors in the theatre for with the exception of the surgical instruments which had been brought from london everything was improvised and home-made with results that were astonishing visitors were surprised to find that the soldiers had no objections to operations being performed by women i soon learned enough of the bulgarian language to be able to understand the questions that were asked upon such points by visitors to the patients in the wards the answers made always satisfied and i think often surprised the inquisitors for the men with one accord agreed that they had never been so gently or so successfully handled by either doctors or nurses whilst our own doctors and nurses corroborated to their last day in hospital the impression gained on the first night that in qualities of courtesy respect and gratitude no patience could surpass these bulgarian peasant soldiers End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen but the patients were not only grateful to their doctors and nurses 
they were also particularly appreciative of the efforts of those who catered for their gastronomic requirements and the kitchen work under mrs godfrey's charge was by no means the least laborious nor the least trying to the temper the kitchen contained no stove and no cooking apparatus except a large open chimney-place the only pots and pans or culinary utensils were three enormous stew-pots which dr radelf had lent us from the red cross store at sophia we could requisition through our lieutenant certain quantities of brown bread sugar cheese salt tea and meat for the use of our patients and of ourselves but meat did not mean convenient butcher meat joints or legs of mutton or rolled ribs of beef brought into the kitchen ready for cooking meat meant bullocks and sheep which arrived at the hospital door not alive but whole and had to be cut up and transformed from ram to mutton broth from trek ox to tidbit by the three lady cooks every day during the seven weeks that we were in hospital these three patient and untiring women prepared cooked and served under conditions of peculiar difficulty all the meals for approximately a hundred ten people every day and it must be added to the entire satisfaction of the patients who continually sent complimentary messages to the kitchen it was soon discovered that good cooking meant in their estimation plenty of red pepper much variety was impossible and the stock dish was a stew composed of chunks of beef or mutton with gravy rice and as many vegetables as could be mustered and if this was smothered till it was the colour of terracotta with pepper derived from the indigenous vegetable inappropriately called a chili no dish from a savoy restaurant menu could have given greater satisfaction the first meal for the patients on full diet was at six a m and consisted of tea no milk but plenty of sugar half a loaf of brown bread for each man and a lump of cheese next followed the night nurse's breakfast at six thirty breakfast for the day nurses and the general staff was at seven brown bread and beef dripping tinned tea and no milk were the staple excitements of this repast occasionally however we were pampered with porridge and still more rarely with eggs which were sometimes brought in from country districts after the armistice began the men's second meal dinner the meal of the day was at twelve it consisted of the much-loved stew as much as they could eat and half a loaf of bread each man our own dinner at one thirty was varied as much or as little as circumstances would permit at six p m tea bread and cheese again for the men and at seven thirty followed our own supper of bully beef and cheese brown bread and tea or sometimes soup patients on special diet were given soup and arrowroot but milk was for a long time unprocurable and was only eventually to be had in very small quantities for the worst cases the superintendence of the serving of the men's meals was the most pleasurable duty of the day for it gave opportunities of having a talk with the patients at a time when they would not be either under the nurses or the doctor's ministrations this dinner hour was for the cooks of course the busiest of the day the stew was emptied by the cook-in-chief into large enamel washing basins and was then carried with half loaves of bread into the different wards of all the three houses by the nurses orderlies and interpreters in each ward the stew was served by the nurses and distributed to the patients by the orderlies and also by the interpreters who all did fine service in any work that was required in either words theatre kitchen or surgery wherever they were at the moment needed and they were much needed everywhere for our small staff a proportion those on night duty were of course by day absent for sleep and rest some again were on the sick list and we were as a rule left with none too many for the daily task of our young men interpreters one was in normal times in charge of the orphanage maintained by mr mahoney in sophia for macedonian and thracian peasant boys he did excellent work for us another a splendidly serviceable and resourceful lad was the son of an english merchant at jamboli he was a fine type of an english boy he never took no for an answer if we wanted yes and he was invaluable to us the two bulgarian boys had been brought up and educated by mr mahoney at the orphanage and also in england and ireland they both had family histories which were painfully typical of turkish suzerainty one of them told us he remembered when he was a child that he was one day sitting drinking coffee in his home with his father and mother when suddenly some turks burst into the room and for no conceivable reason began violently to beat his father about the head with big sticks his mother had then snatched him the boy in her arms and fled 
she was warned not to return but after three months she could not resist going back to the old home to see what had been left she found in the living-room which was otherwise as she had left it her husband's skull and the palm of one hand upon the floor the other bulgarian boy came to me a few days before we closed the hospital and asked if i could very kindly dispense with his further services and give him leave to go to visit his home his father had been a priest in the thracian village in which he and his family lived but suspected by the turks of preaching treason had been sent for three years to prison and had there died and now the boy told me that shortly after this war had broken out the turks had slaughtered three hundred out of the six hundred inhabitants of his village and he was now anxious to get back and see if his mother and sisters were still living or if they were perchance amongst the massacred i asked him with surprise why he had not applied earlier for leave to go i could not imagine how he could all this time have endured the suspense of not knowing whether the only relatives he had on earth were alive or dead he replied calmly if they are dead they are dead and i cannot bring them back i could not leave you here whilst there was work for our wounded to be done but now perhaps i can be spared and this spirit of philosophy of patriotism and also of chivalrous courtesy was typical of the bulgarian nation i had been prepared for the possibility of annoyance from the curiosity of men visitors who in a turkish environment would be unaccustomed to seeing such work conducted solely by women by women who absorbed in their work would have no time for sex frivolities but bulgarian men of all classes could give lessons to the men of most nations of europe in their attitude towards women and the only levity i encountered from the first day to the last of our undertaking was from a german officer he was one day hanging around outside the hospital door and i asked him if he wished to see over the hospital in reply he asked me with a smile of amusement who we were i was explaining to him that we were an organization of english women when he interrupted with the tell-tale question the alley hoops he had given himself away and i replied promptly no nothing of that sort they're all over fifty would you care to see over the hospital now and the young man turned away sorrowfully he had many engagements End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen but a visitor who did eventuate and to some purpose was general vazoff lately appointed governor-general of lozengrad he went over the hospital and highly appreciative asked me if i could pay him a return call at his headquarters in the town and tell him more about our work as he wished to write a report to send to the king's secretary i therefore went one afternoon accompanied by dr kiranoff and we had a long and interesting talk about many things we discussed the terrible destitution prevailing amongst the peasantry as a result of the war and general vazoff said yes it was bad enough now but when the war was over the need for relief would be even greater whilst fighting continued those who had been driven from their homes were sheltering as best they could anywhere but when the war was finished and families were reunited and went back to their old villages to start their normal life again money would be needed to rebuild their houses buy their seeds and stock their farms that he said would be the time when relief would be most needed and when as we all agreed it would be most difficult to obtain because public attention in england and elsewhere would by then have transferred itself to some more topical drama of sensation and that as i also realized would be the time when the steadfastness of noel buxton and his balkan committee would prove their value we then discussed the hospital of the convoy corps and general vazoff much interested inquired the conditions under which we had come to bulgaria to nurse their wounded had we come under the auspices of the british red cross at this point dr kiranoff to my surprise and consternation broke in with some vehemence and gave me away the b r c s he said sent only men with their missions to bulgaria to nurse the sick and wounded they did not think the conditions in bulgaria would be suitable for women madame stobart he said thought the red cross society were mistaken and came out on her own bravo bravo that was well done and we are very grateful enthusiastically exclaimed general vazoff to my great surprise for i had been taken aback at dr kiranoff's frankness thinking that my lawlessness would probably be disapproved by the general but it was otherwise i wish the former added after some further remarks as he glanced round the sparsely furnished room which was serving as his office i could give you some souvenir ah 
he exclaimed as his eye fell on an oil painting mounted but unframed standing on a table against the wall he went up to the picture look he said as he took it in his hands and came towards me this is absolutely the only possession i have here it is a picture of a typical turkish country house on the maritza i looted it a few days ago will you accept it as an insignificant token of appreciation and gratitude i of course accepted the picture with pride to me it was not insignificant for was it not a testimony of the recognition by the highest bulgarian officials of the value of the work accomplished by the convoy corps dr kiranoff then left and i was also preparing to march off with my loot when the general rang a little handbell and told an orderly who came in response to order the carriage to come round at once and then he insisted that i should allow him to take me for a drive and let him show me the environs of kirkilis whilst the carriage was getting ready the governor wrote and gave me two letters one to the queen and one to the secretary of the king giving an enthusiastic report of the work of the convoy corps he told me i was to be sure and deliver these letters myself in person and then the carriage was announced the weather was cold with frost at night and i had no overcoat with me noticing this the general gallantly took off the beautiful grey-blue coat which he was wearing and entrapped me and as i remonstrated he sent for another coat for himself and then clothed in the voluminous and gorgeous uniform of a bulgarian general i solemnly descended the stairs with the governor and followed by the orderlies was bowed into the open phaeton drawn by two horses which awaited us at the door we drove through kirkilis receiving and returning the salutations of the people and of the soldiers who as usual crowded the narrow streets and out into the country beyond we passed amongst the vineyards by the roadside many groups of small oblong mounds of earth the shallow resting-places of the gallant dead who had fallen in the fight around this town it was fortunate that as the governor explained the earth here possesses some curious chemical properties which seem to prevent the usual malodorous results of decomposition general vazoff showed me amongst other points of interest the place where in a small village now destroyed a certain turkish general had a week or two before stood and wept for tears are not the monopoly of women at the defeat which his army at kirk Gilis had sustained but the battle of kirk Gilis was decided not as was recorded in the papers in the streets of kirk Gilis. there was no fighting in the town itself but in the vineyards just outside and in the trenches of fort bulgaria the bulgarians had come trooping down over the mountains and attacked the fort just before dark one evening the turks defended it till nightfall but in the morning when the bulgarians expected to renew the fighting they found to their surprise that the turks had fled towards adrianople and kirkilis was now theirs the dispositions of the respective armies had already been explained to me by a military officer who had been sent with a message for me from the queen he had one evening walked with some of us to the fort about two miles distant from kirkilis and shown us the trenches now strewn with empty cartridge cases from which the turks had made their short defence and it was therefore interesting now in my drive with the governor to fill in the canvas and acquire an aeroplanic vision of the whole battle we drove and talked till it was dark when the general invited me to take coffee with him in the town but it was now time for the men's tea which i never missed the coachman therefore received the order in bulgarian à la mission des dames anglaises and i was deposited at the hospital wondering as i alighted and the governor drove off saluting if there really were people in the world who were bored with life End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this LibriVox recording is in the public domain i soon discovered three people who were on the verge of being very bored with life these were our three washing girls who were waiting to see me before they went home from work i had found that with a crowded hospital it was impossible for our staff to spare time for washing all the soiled sheets pillow-cases night garments etc of the patients and i tried immediately we started hospital to find washerwomen either bulgarian or turkish to come every day but apparently there were either no women in kirk Gilles, or the job wasn't popular and for several days i drew a blank till finally i went as usual as a last resource to the commandant and he promised that bipeds of some sort should be sent to wash for us and the next morning to my great joy three strong nice-looking girls put in an appearance at the hospital 
i sent for one of our particularly intelligent girl interpreters to come and explain the nature of the work required she talked for about five minutes whilst i was busy attending to someone else and told the girls in bulgarian all that would be expected of them and then she turned to ask me some question about soap or wash-tub i then noticed that upon the faces of the washing trio there still rested that same look of placid indifference which i had observed when they first came into the office and they had neither of them opened their lips i asked them in bulgarian if they understood what had been explained to them they shook their heads good gracious are they dumb i asked the interpreter she then asked them if they had understood and immediately the floodgates were opened and a language of which neither of us comprehended one word was poured upon us in a triplicate there was no doubt about the eloquence of the language but i had no time for an eloquence which i didn't understand so i said ja ja exactly so and smiling benignly seized them all three by the arms and dragged them to a shed in which were wooden trenches which had been made for washing troughs by the old carpenters i pointed to a pile of soiled linen on the floor sent for water put some soap into their hands and then uttering a few guttural blessings closed the door and left them conscious of the shortcomings of a somewhat scantily equipped laundry i kept at a distance all the morning but sent a messenger to bring back a report washing was apparently proceeding but the messenger had not stopped to observe details she had precipitately fled when on opening the door to look in she had been greeted by a broadside of gesticulative and unintelligible jargon however though the trio were particularly dense in understanding anything that tended to imply work they had a wonderful knack of finding means of expression for anything they wanted for themselves after a couple of hours of washing they sauntered boldly arm in arm into my office and with the forefingers of their right hands pointing at their widely open mouths and their left hands placed pathetically over their little marys left me no escape from the inference that they were hungry and that it was dinner-time for them i discovered before the day was over from our lieutenant whose mother was a greek that the girls were grecian but the language of signs was i found in many ways convenient and time-saving and as we had no greek interpreter we availed ourselves of hobson's choice and did excellently without for the remainder of our time in hospital i often used to wish as i looked out on all the linen hung up to dry on ropes slung across our tiny back yard that the many well-intentioned folks who in england had with much effort contributed bed garments for the wounded in the balkans could have cast their eyes along that line before they had sat down to their sewing parties they would have saved themselves much wasted labour many recipients of consignments of clothes for the wounded and also for the destitute were much embarrassed to know what to do with the bundles of unusable rubbish with which they had been flooded we were fortunate in having been able to ascertain at sofia the style of bed garment approved by the bulgarian soldier peasantry and had provided for their use washing shirts in flannel and in linen and linen bed drawers the latter specially arranged for the possibility of leg and thigh injuries and these were all thoroughly appreciated by our patients but some of the other missions on the other hand had much trouble on the score of bed garments they had provided for their prospective patients long flannel nightshirts of a pattern not even presented now upon the english stage and the soldiers one and all had refused to wear what they considered an insufficient and indecent covering they demanded to be put to bed in their dirty old uniforms rather than submit to the indecorum of a nightshirt and this although apparently an insignificant trifle was a matter of some concern for of the injuries received by the soldiers in battle the larger proportion were in the legs i have no knowledge of the statistics of other hospitals but in our fourteen wards apart from the outpatients of whom the larger proportion would naturally be suffering from hand and arm wounds i one day estimated that of the eighty-four patients at that moment in the hospital forty-eight had been hit in the legs and sixteen in the arms and of the remainder the injuries were distributed amongst heads shoulders ribs backs etc while seven of the cases were medical this prevalence of leg wounds was explained to me by the soldiers as due to the fact that the turkish soldier is so illiterate that he cannot read the sighting on his rifle and aims point-blank with the usual result that the bullet hits below the mark at which it is aimed even some of the turkish officers presumably some of those risen from the ranks under the old regime were also unable to read or write shrapnel grenade mauser and mannlicher bullets each told its own graphic tale 
it was of interest to note that the mauser in general use by the turks was more merciful in effect than the manlicker used by the bulgarian army but of the murderous projectiles used shrapnel was of course the most disastrous in its effects and a terrible shattering was the result in one case a large portion of the buttocks had been completely torn away and it seemed impossible that the man should live but he like most of our patients recovered in marvellous fashion another man came in with his right arm shockingly shattered by shrapnel he had travelled in the usual comfortless ox-carts for five days from lula Burgas. he arrived in an exhausted condition and was suffering as many were when first admitted from severe shock he was discovered the next morning weeping disconsolately we asked him what was the matter and he then confided to us after a little hesitation that he was engaged to be married and he was terribly afraid that if as he feared he should lose his arm his fiancee who was of course the only girl in all the world might refuse to marry him at that time we also feared that his arm could not possibly be saved but he was told that if he kept up his spirits and was brave he had a good chance of getting well and keeping his arm and owing to the skill of the doctors and the devotion of the nurses the arm was saved and our friend a particularly handsome and attractive personality will it is hoped by now be safely married and in process of living happily ever after and now as i am myself neither a doctor nor a nurse and contributed therefore nothing whatever directly to the therapeutical results it is i hope permissible here to dilate a little on the really wonderful percentage of recoveries effected by our doctors and our nurses amongst seven hundred twenty nine cases that were treated there was only one death and that was a medical case the patient who was apparently recovering and had that very afternoon been much aggrieved because he was not allowed to get up and dress died suddenly and unexpectedly in the night from heart trouble following as the post-mortem confirmed a mild and incipient attack of typhoid it is true in mitigation of this somewhat remarkable record that the men who belonged to a vigorous healthy stock had been accustomed all their lives to plain food and wholesome living and were free in an exceptional degree from immoral diseases and were therefore peculiarly exempt from excesses of all kinds and yielded the more readily to treatment it is true also that many of these seven hundred twenty nine patients were outpatients who would of course be comparatively less seriously wounded but the nature of the injuries of those others approximately three hundred who filled the wars during the seven weeks of our residence was severe enough to tax the ability and care of the ablest of both professions of doctors and of nurses i attribute their success not only to the skill and restraint of the doctors in operations and to the devotion of the nurses in the wards but to the extreme care taken by the sisters in the sterilization of the instruments etc in the theatre soldiers who came into the hospital with their brains protruding through their skulls at first paralyzed in speech and in every limb men with buttocks shot away men with arms and legs shattered with wounds which made it impossible to believe as you gazed upon them that this raw bleeding nauseous smelling object formed part of a human being these one and all recovered in what seemed to me miraculous fashion and i am confident that i may without partiality justly praise the skill and devotion of the doctors and the nurses and the patients and the dogged hard work of the kitchen staff which effected this result it was to my mind also worthy of note that this little band of women drawn from classes accustomed in their own homes to every luxury should have withstood not only the work but the hardships and privations without a grumble or a word of discontent from the time they left victoria station to the time when they returned there in safety i must however also praise the character of the soldiers themselves it would be difficult i think to find in any country a pure more wholesome chivalrous type of men than those whom it was our privilege to heal the majority eighty per cent of these peasant soldiers were as i ascertained in each case from personal inquiry proprietors of their own land owning on an average from ten to two hundred decars from two that is to fifty acres it was not therefore perhaps surprising that an army composed of soldiers of this type should have been in their war with the allies victorious against the turk no better argument against a professional has compared with a territorial army could well it seemed to me have been afforded than by this war in which by far the larger amount of professionalism was on the losing side 
if wars were only fought by those who like the bulgarian peasants had everything to lose and nothing personally to gain by going to war there would be fewer wars and those only would be fought which had moral justice rather than political expediency as the compelling force in her subsequent war against her former allies bulgaria has laid herself open to a charge of greed and a land hunger it is impossible that once in the field and grown accustomed to the horrors of war faced too with the prospect of destitution which in any event probably awaited them on their return to their homes when the war was over the bulgarian army may have succumbed to the human passion of territorial greed and aggrandizement if that were so they have paid the penalty but no one who had mixed and spoken as i did for weeks with hundreds of these bulgarian soldiers and their officers would for a moment believe that the prospect of a problematic extension of boundaries would in the first onset have persuaded these three hundred thousand peasants to leave their homes and families to abandon their crops and means of livelihood to risk death and mutilation for themselves and destitution for their wives and children and to come out on the battlefield against an army of professional and lifelong soldiers the bulgarian peasant though he has proved himself to be a soldier equal to europe's best did not fight from a passion of land hunger nor for the love of fighting he was driven from his homestead by an ideal he was sustained in the dismal trenches by an ideal and the point of his bayonet was sharpened by an ideal the ideal that drove those many thousand peasants who filled the bulgarian hospitals from the lethargy of their agricultural life and the peacefulness of their domestic happiness was the ideal of nationhood intuitive in all those who have an evolutionary mission to perform the first stage of progress towards nationhood is freedom and freedom was impossible under the heel of the turk therefore the turk must go this the ideal which inspired the bulgars in their crusade against the turks will remain as their ideal till it is accomplished europe may as far as bulgaria is concerned believe what she likes as to the greed and rapacity of the bulgarian people europe will make a great mistake if she thinks these people will ever abandon an ideal which they have once visualized the turk they said must go and the turk was defeated not because he has no good qualities he probably has as many potential virtues as the bulgars or even as the british nation the turk was defeated when the odds were not overwhelmingly against him because he has no longer an ideal his old ideal the mohammedan faith was not built upon the rock of ages but upon the sands of time and is being annihilated by the tide of progress the history of all dynamic movements is universally the same they must either expand and grow with the growing life around them or become fossils fit only for museums the spirit of cruelty of intolerance of sensuality that breathes in every sentence of the koran is not capable of adaptation to new conditions the koran was a creed of opportunism the inspiration was furious the fire is burnt out the young turk had become aware that the core of his faith was rotten that the inspiration of his religion was dead that he had no longer a religious ideal pathetically in his need he had turned blindly for inspiration to that paris which had supplied him in this world with the joys which his religion had only promised in the next he sought in the cold and barren positivism of comte for that religious zeal fervour and idealism which alone can drive nations on to victory he sought life's blood from a stone the result was disaster and defeat in that turkish army of professional soldiers there was lacking that physical something more which on the bulgarian side converted hordes of imperfectly trained peasants into an army which has proved itself worthy with some mistakes accepted to rank amongst the finest europe has known i disbelieve the stories that have been circulated by their enemies of atrocities committed by these bulgarian peasant soldiers they are a proud and reserved race and would no more think of elaborately defending themselves against the falsehoods uttered by their enemies than they would themselves utter falsehoods against those enemies but if when every man's hand was against them and after months of fighting during which their eyes had rested on nothing but blood and carnage if then the power of suggestion produced its accustomed result and gentle men like those we nursed in our hospital at kirk Kilis, have at times seen red that would not be an argument against the humanity of the bulgarian soldier it would be an indictment against the barbarity of a civilized europe 
which still elaborately trains its populations to settle their differences and adjust their boundaries by blood and carnage the barbarism of taking life lies not in the jesuitical distinction between taking life in cold blood or taking life in the heat of battle it is the taking life that is the barbarism but mohammedanism the religion invented by a man for the benefit of men only still absorbs the religious devotion of one-fifth of the human race is it then a wonder that the world's ideals of humanity and of heroism should be tinctured by essence of maleness men are said to love danger better than work if this is a fact could not this insensibly tend to blur their distinction between ideals of humaneness and of heroism it may be true as saith zarathustra that only where there are graves are there resurrections but is it not also a truth not unknown to history that resurrections are sometimes revealed first to women may it not possibly be from women that the world will eventually learn to realize that god rules the universe as fourier reminds us by attraction not by force End of chapter twenty